Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about the closed range photogrammetry. Uh, you know about the aerial photogrammetry from photogrammetry and remote sensing course, which was mostly covered, like planning, processing. Uh, this is mostly about high precision photogrammetry that you can achieve micrometer accuracy, good, which has application in surveying, in engineering, in uh, like this one here. This picture is like. Uh, criminal, like Albert, uh, who wrote this module initially. Uh, actually, Albert doing fantastic stuff uh, in like trying to capture criminals, and uh, he will appear in the court, for example, and he has to explain, like, a, pro from professional aspects, like whether this scenario is possible or not. Sometimes they have to do the measurement on the face of criminal to and then they create a 3D model, and then they try to match it with other criminal records or people that they know and find the criminal. So it's quite exciting. And some of the, like I know at least four or five surveyors who are working with police, and then they try to find uh, criminals in different ways. Like this was, a, I think this was an example. Like Albert was doing the example of shooting happened in Melbourne a couple of years ago. And uh, they actually, that was a successful case that they could capture the person just simply by using the uh, CCTV cameras and the pictures they've got. Anyway, so what we are going to talk about, I'm, I'm quickly over like, giving you the principle of close range photogrammetry, knowing the fact that you've done this course hopefully last semester or quite recently. Uh, so I'm quickly just remember some of the stuff that you need to know. And then we are going to talk about, about more stuff about calibration of the cameras, how you're going to do the planning for close range photogrammetry. And at the end, I'm going to talk about dynamic photogrammetry, which is the case for moving object or moving cameras. Good. Okay. This picture here is actually showing you different techniques we have in, uh, surveying and engineering uh, applications and based on the object size and the accuracy requirement you can decide which techniques is suitable to you. So far we learned about, I don't know, the conventional surveying that we knew about that before even this course. We know about GPS, yep, or RTK. We know about what else we know, laser scanning for example. You're going to learn about metrology in next week or next module. So. If you look at this, you see, for example, for aerial uh, photogrammetry, is actually for the object, big area or big object. If you want to capture the very big area and then the accuracy is not so much important for you, good, then you will use, for example, UAV. UAV is good like within centimeter accuracy, not, not giving you very good heighting accuracy, good. It gives you the good posi horizontal position accuracy, but not vertical. Again, this, that's why if you look at it, it's just aerial photo, uh, photogrammetry is somewhere between 10 mil to, not thousand, if you use like aircraft and like nowadays we can achieve very good, like it's probably, I should say, separate UAV from aerial photogram photogrammetry because UAV is giving you more precise than like a old aircraft that we used to take a photos of. Anyway, if you just keep going, like we go to laser scanning. What is the laser scanning accuracy? Do you reckon? Uh, somewhere between, not quite one mil, but within millimeter accuracy, and it can go up to, I don't know, 15 or, I don't know, 20 mil or something. So, is again for the object size, yeah, like you can use the laser scanning for the buildings, yep, yeah, for the, I don't know, interior of the building and exterior of the buildings, tunnel, mining, all those applications. What we are teaching today is called industrial photogrammetry, or they we call it high precision close range. Good. It has application in medical science, it has application in Engineering, for example, mechanical engineer where they want to design a car and they take the photo, create a 3D model. 
Uh, it has applications to Wang, like when they do the inspection for the bridge and dam, uh, they actually take a photo and they can uh, do the monitoring for those uh, structure. Good. Uh, for example, mobile laser scanning is the integration of the laser scanning camera and G GPS or GNSS. Good. So there is a camera behind the laser scanning because we know laser scanning by itself is only giving you the points. Yeah. It doesn't give you the texture. You need to have the camera to get the texture for the, uh, for your, uh, mobile laser scanning. Same thing with UAV. UAV is using camera. UAV is not only aerial. It can be close range. Like I've seen UAV used for the dam monitoring, like trying to take the pictures of the dam wall. And then they create a 3D model and they use that, like they do that every few months or every year and then monitor the dam movement. Good. They put some targets on that. Okay. So, uh, we do have different sensors as we know. We, we can have a camera. I know you know that. So I quickly going over. We know that we have, for example, infrared camera. We have a thermal camera. Yep. Can be, uh, digital image or RGB. Why we are using the close range? Because we want to know about the position, shape, size, volume, angle, speed, acceleration, all those things of the, an object. Good. Uh, what type of platform we can use? Most of them you know. The only thing might be new in this course is just these two, you know, handheld on tripod. There's nothing new about them. You might permanently put uh, your camera or imaging system somewhere. How it can happen, for example, now we know that Total Session has a camera. Yeah? They, they have the camera and they can take a picture. Uh, when we get to the monitoring, I'm going to also upload some industrial interviews for you guys to have a look. I did couple, like four interviews so far with industry people regarding the topic I'm teaching. Like we have the interview for monitoring. We have an interview for laser scanning. Um, I did interview people for mobile laser scanning and laser scanning in general. So we have four, uh, four type of interviews from industry people. And they're going to talk with you about different techniques they are using, which I found it quite interesting. So I will put it up next week. Please watch. If you have time, there are short ones. There are like about 20 half an hour each, so it's not really long, long interview. But when I interviewed one of the guys for monitoring, uh, they actually did a fantastic job, and they just put in their robotic toaster station, mounted somewhere permanently, and that robotic toaster station is programmed to take the reading every, I don't know, every year, every, not, sorry, not every year, every day, reading to the targets, good, and then it gives the targets uh, movement to whoever is in charge of that. There is a Trimble online solution, and they can also get the message sent to them and say, hey, target, I don't know, 100, is, has a, like a, a massive movement outside what is acceptable. And they can have a look at the camera of the total session. The guy actually showed me. They can go and click on the total session. They can access the camera of the total station and have a look at the target and see, oh, there is a ribbon is in front of that. That's why total session co couldn't read to that target. Good. And see what's going on, which is quite amazing. We can have mobile uh, platform like your car, which is mobile laser scanning. Yep. We, as, as I said, we can have different type of the sensor, which I already covered. Uh, we know from the photogrammetry remote sensing, the camera can be classified to metric and non-metric. Uh, metric cameras are the cameras that you know the calibration parameter, which include the distortion, include the principal point, include the focal length. So those calibration parameter is known. Good. So it's, it's, will, it will be given to you by manufacturer, for example. So there are very high precise cameras like as compared to non-metric cameras because uh, you don't need to calibrate them quite often uh, as the parameter of the, as I said, focal lens, uh, principal point, distortion of the lens, everything is already known. How about non-metric cameras? If I want to give you an example, most of the camera you are using, I would say is non-metric. <coughs> so how, what's the easy way to distinguish between metric and non-metric? 
most of the metric cameras uh, you see on the edge they have some graded points or they have fiducial mark what they say we do have digital metric cameras like digital SLR cameras like Nikon has one uh, so anyway which are the best yeah the best camera to be used is digital metric cameras for our purpose so what type of I, I added this bit because I found that we, we are not talking about them but when I'm saying metric and non-metric, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Because in reality, you, even, you only have compact camera, SLR camera, you know, studio camera. So I was thinking maybe I categorize them in other ways so it makes sense for you. So if I want to tell you what type of cameras we can have based on the uh, optical system, good. We can say we have viewfinder or compact camera. Uh, what is viewfinder? Do you know the eyepiece that you look through? They call it viewfinder. Good. So in the past, there was no LCD. Good. Uh, it was only viewfinder. You look through, you take a photo. You're probably so much younger than me to remember, but I could remember them easily. And then as the time passes, they started to have LCD screen for the camera so you could see the picture while you're taking that. Good. So. Why they call it compact camera? This type of camera, they had imaging uh, system and like the imaging system and optical system, they're all combined good. So they're compact. There is no separation between the like uh, lens or I don't know, optical system. So they're all in one unit. That's why they're very light. Good. Have you seen this camera? Like the Sony camera down here is the example of the compact, which are they are still exist yeah we are using them and it's cheap and it's very efficient they have a good resolution for just taking the photograph but is it good for us no you're never gonna use cam compact camera for high precision close range it's gonna be good for low resolution job what would be low resolution job for example have you seen they try to take a photo of accident? Many surveyors actually working in with police in terms of accident. They sometimes bring the total station in the scene if there is a very big accident to take the measurement. Or what they can do easily, they put some scale bar and then they take a photo. Do you remember from photogrammetry and remote sensing? They take a photo and then they can go and do the measurement and create the scenario of what happened. Good. So, what else is low resolution if they want to have 3D model of the city, which is mostly for planning purpose, not for surveying. Good. So, as a surveyor, what do we use then? We probably use single uh, lens reflex camera, which we call it DSLR camera. Have you seen DSLR? Digital single lenses reflex camera. Why they call single lenses reflex camera? Look up here in this photo. So this is the example of the SLR camera. They have a mirror, rotating mirror. So what's happening during the exposure, the mirror is lifting up and then it deflects the light ray and then it's coming to the eyepiece so you can see the image upright. Otherwise, it's going to be reverse. Yep. So that's actually helping you to see the image as it is. Otherwise, lens is reversing the image. Good. So, uh, SLR camera actually are very uh, popular. The reason is the ratio of price to performance is very good for them. They are not too expensive and they have a good performance and good resolution. So, they usually will be used for high end application or very precise application. As I said, we have a digital metric camera or digital SLR camera, like many companies that we do that, and it's very good for doing any high precision close range job. Good. Now, what is the last one? You're not going to see that too often, but I, I was talk, like, let's, uh, telling you what's the difference between a studio camera and SLR. Again, many of the artists, even they want to do like a very good camera, they might use the SLR and don't bother to go with the study camera. A study camera are very bulky, hot, heavy weight cameras. Um, they give you the ultimate resolution for the picture, uh, but they, they have very good option in terms of translation between the lenses and focus. So that's why they give you very sharp and good resolution images. 
Are we going to use it as a surveyor? Probably I say no. It's most of the time used by landscape or architect, uh, archi architect people for uh, like doing, like taking a photo of the building, very high resolution, which we don't need to have that. Good. We, we don't want to have the pretty image. We want to do the measurement, which is more. So, which one to go? SLR camera. Good. And I'm telling you this, you might laugh at me and so say, even if you don't tell us, we know. No, sorry to say that, but I've, I've seen, <coughs> I've sat in one of the student final project and he was trying to do the bridge inspection using the iPhone. And it was so wrong. A, iPhone that you're using is, is categorized under compact camera. Yep. Yeah? The optical and imaging system are compact. That's why it's very light. Yeah. It's, it's just in, in your phone. Good. It doesn't give you the high resolution to start off. There was no doubt about that, but he even hasn't done any calibration for the camera. Do you remember last semester I asked you to take a photo? I don't know. Have you done photo and remote? Uh, so I don't know whether you've done it with me or not, uh, but we had a, in the classroom, I even uploaded online, if you followed online tutorial. So we printed the coded targets and we put it on the ground and I asked everyone to come and take a photo with their own phone and we <coughs> calibrated their phone, their phone and we got the parameters for the camera of your phone. And then it was very fun and interesting. But, but that person haven't, hasn't even done that. He didn't even know what's the focal length of the camera. It just relied on the manufacturer, which is so wrong. Good. So if you're really doing the high precision job, the takeaway from this slide is don't try compact. You probably go for SLR or more. Good. I'm going to talk about something which is not written obviously here, but there is a, a camera, especially built for measurement. There are not like some of the brands, you know, like <coughs> Sony, I don't know, Nikon, they're not like that. Mm -hmm. they, one of them I put in the study book, uh, it calls INCA, good, it's from the IGDS company, but it's geodetic um, camera and it's actually specifically built for measuring, good. They are very expensive though. They are about, I don't know, 20K, 30K. You really need to uh, think about them before you buying them. But why they are too expensive? Because they have the built-in software, which can, you can take a photo, yep, and then the software inside the camera can create the XYZ for your targets. So in, in real time, good. And then you can, connect your camera to your whatever software it is and then it gives you all those XYZ for all the targets. So it's very good. Those high precision cameras are very good especially if you want to map the dynamic object which is moving so it can easily identify the target. So it's identify and measure the target uh, with the inbuilt software inside the camera which is quite interesting anyway. So this is an example of the studio camera, if you want to know how it may look like. <coughs> so I know you know a stereo image processing. I just wanted to know what you know, what we're going to concentrate more in this module, because this is advanced course. So we're going to add something to whatever you know, yeah? Take it a little bit further. So if you remember from photo photogrammetry, to create a 3D model, we need to have at least two images, yeah? left and right image, good. And then you get some information about the object. You can put the targets, yep, yeah, and you know how big is your object, so you know the object distance thing and how far you need to be and how many stations you need to have, all those things. And then we need to, once you put left and right image, you can create a 3D model, yep. Yeah? But that 3D model, A, you need to know the orientation of the camera in respect to each other, yep. Yeah? Exterior orientation, if you remember, X, Y, Z, gamma, phi, kappa, good. Like rotation around the axis of X, Y, Z, like I need to know where is my first left camera and orientation. I need to know where is my right camera and orientation to be able to build that 3D model, good. And once I get that, I obviously I need to know interior parameter of the camera, which is camera <coughs> calibration. And then once you've done all of those things, 
then your 3D model is just orientated and is georeferenced, good. And then the software start matching the tie points for you, start doing the finding all those common points for you and create the point clouds and then you can go further and have the coordinates of the targets on the ground coordinate system. Good. So you might say, okay, I know all of them. I was like, yes, but when we did the photogrammetry removal sensing, we didn't quite cover interior parameter. We just talked more about exterior <laughs> parameter of the camera, that how you're going to position them. But in this course, I'm going to show you what are the techniques we are using for camera calibration, and we're going to talk about how we're going to plan the close range in real life, how we're going to decide this about what would be the object distance based on the accuracy, how we're going to uh, find the orientation of the camera, interior orientation of the cameras. Okay, before I show you this scary formula, rule of thumb, I'm never going to ask you to remember any formula in the photogrammetry, good? You don't need it. So why I'm showing you here, just to tell you what you can get, like just simple explanation of what's happening in behind the software, good? Obviously, when you're doing the calibration, you just put the images in the software and then it will give you some parameters. But most of the students, they are struggling to interpret the parameters, good? What are, what is K? What is P? Yeah? Uh, you probably only know F, which is focal lens. <laughs> so we're going to explain what's happening behind the software, but I'm never going to ask you to write something like this, good? We're going to know just what it is. So before I talk about the calibration and interior orientation of the camera, I need to remind you some of the equation you had for collinearity. What does it mean collinear? It means that your object point, good, your center of the camera and your image point, based on the photogrammetry rule, they are in one line. If you consider that and then you write and you're a mathematician, for example, and then you sit down and write this formula here based on them being on one line, good. This is only for one light ray, one, one object to be mapped or image on the photo. Now, if you do that, what can I get from this formula is some of the exterior parameter of the camera, like orientation of the camera, which is X, Y, Z, this one here. The center of the camera, I can get where, where is the center of the camera, good, where is the position of the camera, this is the position of the camera, and these are the rotation around X, Y, Z. This is exterior orientation of the camera. So based on your image coordinate and ground coordinates, you can find out that, and you can also find out some of the information about interior orientation. What are the interior orientation of the camera? I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. but the only thing you can get from collinearity uh, equation is just where is your principal point or the center of the image and what is the focal length or I call it here C, I call it principal distance, but it's actually your focal length. It's just X, there are two terms for one thing. Good. So if you're happy, how are we going to use that again? Have you remember bundle adjustment technique we had in photon remote? I'm pretty sure no. So, what is bundle adjustment? That one was for one point only. If you apply collinearity equation for number of points, like a block of the points, then you apply least square to solve for unknown parameters. You've done comes B, you know least square, good. What's the least square technique? It's actually tell, helping you to find some unknown parameters, good, based on by based on minimizing the errors. You assume that the, you're going to minimize the error, and then you're going to find out some of the unknown parameters. What are the unknown parameters here? We, we know the image coordinates. That is not is known. Yeah? We know that. Do we know the focal lens? No, we're going to find out. Good. Do I know the ground coordinates? Yes, I should know that to solve the equation. Yeah, you need to have some known, do you remember we need to have some control points to be able to solve? It's the same 
for least square, you need to have redundant observations to be able to solve for those unknowns. So, uh, do I know the ground coordinates of exposure station? I may know or not. If your camera has GPS, yes, you know, then it helps you to solve better exterior orientation. If not, we assume that we don't know. Good, we can solve it. I don't know. Do I know the rotation? These M1, 2, 3. If you remember from INS, I'm pretty sure when uh, Glenn told you last week, he showed you some matrix of the rotation from transforming the object coordinate system to ground coordinate system. So it's pretty much the same, not similar, uh, because there are some different rotation. But we use the same similar, similar matrix to transform from object coordinate system to ground coordinate system. Good. These are the elements of those matrices. Is the rotation good? Do I need to know them? No, in reality. That's why we didn't bother. We just say M1, M, M11, M12. You don't need to know. You just need to understand. So do I know them? No, I want to find out. What is the orientation of my camera? Yeah, the rotation. I don't know. So from that, you can get what, what I can get. You can get these elements. Good. The rotation element. Gamma phi kappa. And then if you if you look at there is a new term in this formula, which is lens distortion. What is lens distortion? I'm going to explain. Good. Uh, but this is actually related to interior orientation of your camera. Good. This is one of those calibration parameters we need to know. So far so good? Do I ever examine you on this? No. So don't worry. It's just for giving you an idea of what's happening behind the software. It's neither in the exam nor in the assignment. What is important to me is these things, because you need to understand the concept more than math. Good? So I told you, software using bundle adjustment technique and collinearity equation to be able to solve for exterior and interior orientation of the camera. But when I'm saying interior orientation of camera, what I mean is actually camera calibration. What are the camera calibration parameters that we need to define? Yeah, we need to know to process the images correctly and get the high precise measurement. So the first one is principal distance. What is the principal distance? Is the distance from center of the camera to your image plane, which is actually your focal lens. Good. Here we call it principal distance. We need to know the principal point of other collimation, which is basically the center of the image. This is point here. Good. PP. Do you remember PP? Principal point? Good. So far we know these two, so we have no problem. They are not new thing. We knew it. The new stuff are these last four that you probably haven't heard of them. We also need to uh, calculate or find out what is the radial lens distortion. It's obvious from the name is based on the radius or radial distance. Good. But where that distance is coming from? Have a look at this image here. Good. We have the center of the image somewhere here. And then as you go, this, if I call this R, small r, the radial distance from the point to the center of the image, that can vary, yeah, for different points. Good. As you go toward the edges of the image, it gets, that distortion is getting bigger and bigger. So if I want to give you a very simple example to know what is radial distortion means, have you ever taken an image and you've seen that the vertical line looks like a curve on the edges? Have you seen that? If your camera shows, the, like if you're taking photo of the building, for example, and building should look like upright here, yep, sorry. Should look like this in the image, good. But if your image slightly, not quite my drawing, but it's slightly curving the vertical line, there is a lens distortion in your camera, which needs to be fixed. That's why we need to find out. And then we can apply those corrections and correct our images. Good. 
Now, uh, we also have tangential disorder. I didn't put it because it can be very difficult for you to get, but for you, just radial distortion is enough for now. Good? That's a little bit more advanced. We also have this centering distortion. What is this centering? Have a look up here. In reality, all of the elements of your lens should be in line. Good? But if your center of the lens, uh, sorry, is one, one element is out, like this one here, is a little bit higher, yeah? If you look at the center of this, it's just shifted or is tilted. It might be tilted, good? If one of them is not in line with the others, we call that decentering distortion, which creates an error in your image, which needs to be fixed, good? So, this is the example of decentering. We have out of plane deformation. What's that out of plane deformation? Is this example here? Do you know about smalls uh, and CCD? Smalls or CCD is like a chip in your camera. So, if they have been like sometimes, if you if your camera is old, they start to be deformed. Good, coming out of the shape that they need to be. Like they need to be like a plane. But if you look up here, there is a deformation here. So you need to find out what, how much they deform. Sometimes if the deformation is more than what is acceptable, then you have to send it back to the manufacturer to be fixed yeah? or be replaced. So these two or last two, they are mostly related to manufacturers. So if something wrong, we can't really do anything. We have to send it back. It's pretty much like a, your total station. There are some calibration. You can do it using the software. Yeah, you can fix it. You can apply, for example, horizontal vertical collimation error and fix your observation. Am I right? In the total station. But if there is a big issue with your, uh, say, EDM unit and it doesn't measure distance correctly, then you can't really do much. You have to send it back and then they have to fix it. Good. So. The first four we can fix using the software or the, uh, you can, we can find the correction and then you will put the camera calibration parameter into the software and software will correct the images based upon that. But the last two, if there is any error, so bad, so sad, we have to send it back. So what's the last one? It's actually about the color collimation. Is this image here, I don't know how, whether you can see, is dynamic fluctuation in color collimation. So you can see, there is a fluctuation in the color or image colors you get. That also comes from the hardware part of the cameras that we can't really do anything. If there is more than exceeding the limit, we obviously there's something wrong with your camera. Good. So all these things can be extracted from camera calibration. So, uh, I better stop my lecture here, give you a quick break, and then we come back and we continue for the rest of the lecture.